The world in 1984 mercifully didn't look quite like what George Orwell envisioned in his famous dystopian novel. However, something did happen that year. The very first Apple Macintosh was released, giving average people the chance to own their very own personal computer with a graphical user interface, or GUI, for the low price of just $2,495. And while that may seem steep, especially for the dollar value back then, it was a breakthrough at the time, since Apple's previous GUI-based computer, the Lisa, sold for 10 grand. So it was no big surprise that it was the Mac instead that popularized the concept of using a mouse to click on what you want instead of having to type everything into a DOS-style command line. But as innovative as a mainstream GUI for home users was, the original Mac OS wasn't without its shortcomings. Although it introduced the now familiar file folder, the first Mac OS file system didn't truly support nested directories. DOS actually did this prior to the release of the first Mac. And while the original Mac was also incapable of multitasking for the most part, its more intuitive interface compared to command line operating systems paved the way for GUIs to become standard in home PCs. In fact, there was some pretty messy litigation that went on after Microsoft licensed elements of Mac OS users interface for early versions of Windows, as Apple claimed that Microsoft borrowed beyond the license terms. But although Apple pioneered the home PC GUI, it didn't really change a whole lot, aside from incremental performance improvements, until the release of System 7 in 1991, which made true color rendering a standard feature for the first time, removed the old 8 megabyte RAM limit thanks to 32-bit support, added the true type fonts, which would make it much easier to tell what a printout would look like, added virtual memory, true multitasking, and the all-important drag-and-drop functionality we've all come to take for granted today. System 7 was also the first Mac OS to support those PowerPC processors that remained one of the core differentiators between Macs and IBM PC compatibles, or Wintel machines, until 2006. And although the move to PowerPC meant an increase in performance compared to older Macs, application support for the Mac platform still lagged behind Wintel computers. This meant that Apple was facing a decline in profit for several years, but they started to reverse their fortunes by rolling out Mac OS 8 in 1997, which featured an actual color interface like the ones we're accustomed to seeing today, a customizable background, and native ability to search the web. Speaking of which, this was the first Mac OS to include a default browser, but no, not Safari, Internet Explorer, as per an agreement with Microsoft. Mac OS 9, released a couple years later, featured things like 128-bit encryption support and better voice recognition, but a massive change came in 2001, when the now ubiquitous OS X made its debut. OS X's underlying code was completely different from all other Mac OS versions in order to be more attractive to third-party software developers. Of course, there were plenty different for the average user as well, including much sleeker interface called Aqua. That's sort of foreshadowed the, what Microsoft would later do with XP later that year. More stable multitasking, system-wide spell checking, and of course, revisions all named after big scary cats for whatever reason. Instead of releasing all new operating systems every few years, Apple has focused on incremental improvements to OS X since 2001, with features like DVD playback, multi-user switching, and 64-bit support being added over time. OS X Tiger, released in 2005, was a particularly important revision, as Tiger was the first version of Mac OS to support the new 64-bit Intel chips that started making their way into Apple PCs the very next year. Mac OS's move toward support for x86-64 has made it a more popular program for software developers, meaning OS X has carved out a nice niche for itself in several markets, particularly designers and content creators, especially the ones that are interested in spending $3,000 on a workstation that looks like a futuristic wastebasket. Speaking of content creators, lynda.com. With a lynda.com membership, you can watch and learn from top experts who are passionate about teaching. You can even stream thousands of video courses on demand and learn on your own schedule at your own pace. I do that. I'm trying to learn how to film things and take cool pictures and edit them later on. And they have tons of courses on that. My instructor is awesome. It's great. And I can take notes in their thing, app, web page, whatever you want, and refer to them later on. You can download tutorials, watch them on the go. That's helpful if you commute places. You can watch them on iOS or Android. You can save playlists of courses that you want to watch to customize your learning path or even to just share with friends, colleagues, and team members. 
Your lynda.com membership will give you unlimited access to all this training stuff on tons of topics, all for the flat rate of $25 per month. Whether you're looking to become an industry expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just kind of really just want to learn something and you're a little bored. Check out lynda.com slash lynda.com slash techquickie and sign up for a free 10 day trial. All right, guys, like the video if you liked it, dislike it if you disliked it. There's a cool video coming on Linus Tech Tips. It should actually already be here. I'm not sure though, so maybe click up here. Who knows? But it's gonna be about VR, it's a comparison between the Vive and the Oculus Rift, so check it out. Comment down below if you have suggestions for future tech cookies, quick, <laughs> tech cookies, and don't forget to subscribe and follow.